<laughs> Amen. The book of Ezekiel, the 21st chapter. We start chapter 21 night. One of the most important books or chapters in the book of Ezekiel. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's just, it just uh, you hang with me in this chapter because it's, it's, not a, it's not one of those shouting chapters. It's not one of those that, uh, uh, you know, you, you get all excited about because he gets right down to where the nitty-gritty is. I mean, uh, gets right down to the, where the rubber beats the road, and he, he just does it like it is. And a lot of people don't want to talk about uh, uh, things such as this, the coming judgment of God on, uh, on uh, people of any kind. Uh, we don't like to look at that. We, like, we, we want all the happy moments. We want all the exciting things. We want everything hyped up. But I'm going to tell you somewhere uh, along the line, we got to get it right before God. Uh, I'll tell you, listen, read it with me tonight. Chapter 21, verse, verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem. Drop thy word toward the holy places. Prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, uh, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, uh, seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh, from the south to the north, that, I, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath, it shall not return any more. Sigh, therefore, thou son of man, with the breaking of thy loins, and with a bitterness sigh before their eyes. And it shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou, that thou shalt answer for the tidings, uh, because it cometh, and every heart uh, shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and all knees uh, shall be as, be as weak as water. Behold, it cometh, and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord God. Father, week after week, we have been in this book. <laughs> well, we're coming to, and have been now to a section, Lord, that uh, many of us... Uh, a heart breaks over our nation as we see uh, it paralleling the nation of Israel during this time. I'm asking the Lord, would you open our hearts tonight? Uh, somehow speak to us. Uh, Father, just stir our soul this evening with a word from on high. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, penetrate where we are tonight. Uh, if there's lethargy, if there's Father apathy, if there's uh, this, that, which is... Uh, we're not concerned about the things God stirs this evening. Uh, stir our hearts to that place uh, that draws us closer to you than we've ever been in one another. Bless our time tonight. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, lead and guide us to your truth. And we'll thank you for it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, from chapter 14, verse 1, we saw the elders coming in uh, and sitting before Ezekiel. Ezekiel had a word from God. Uh, here's a crowd of religious uh, guys who could not get a word from God. Uh, they was having a hard time knowing where things was going. They was hearing all kinds of conversations, uh, false prophets on every side. Their mind is messed up and mixed up about what to do and what direction to go. And so uh, Ezekiel has got a word for them. Uh, we find it again in chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, uh, these elders are sitting before the Lord. Now remember, where we've been in uh, uh, now for several weeks in this of accountability and responsibility. We dealt at first with it, uh, individual responsibility in the 18th chapter of the book uh, of Ezekiel. Individual responsibility. Every one of us is responsible for our own sin. Uh, uh, the father is not responsible for his son, or his son responsible for the father. We're individually held accountable. We're going to stand on our own before God and give an account for everything we've said and thought and done. Done. The Bible declares that Paul said in the second Corinthians uh, that we would be at least those uh, are saved at the judgment seat of Christ, given account uh, of the stewardship of our lives. You know, we have a life on loan from God, and that life is required of a steward accountability. Uh, uh, chapter 19, we dealt with in the 
not only individual stewardship and responsibility, but leadership. Every leader, and if you're a father tonight, if you're a husband, uh, you are a leader of your household. God expects us as leaders of our household uh, to do what is right, uh, raising our family, protecting our family, and having them uh, uh, understand and know the things of God. Uh, we dealt last time, uh, last few weeks, in national uh, responsibility. Uh, uh, the national responsibility that is over our nation tonight is tremendous. Uh, uh, the major themes uh, uh, of accountability. And, and that of responsibility or issues not too many people want to deal with in these days. Uh, they want to blame somebody else, skirt the issue, put it off, let it go. But God, uh, God is going to hold every single one accountable. Uh, the elders was getting their ear full. Uh, they, they, I, I can I can imagine what they must have looked at like sitting there before Ezekiel and uh, that word of the Lord coming to them. And, and I'm sure that when that word was coming, uh, uh, they, was, they was wanting to really get out of there probably. Uh, uh, but tonight I want to deal with divine responsibility. Israel had been in a pattern uh, of disobedience uh, uh, and, and rebellion against God. Uh, and God was now bringing a judgment upon Israel. Israel. He was going to deal with Judah and Jerusalem. And tonight I want to deal with this thing called divine responsibility. Could, could you run and give me a, a thing of water? But one, for some reason or another, it never happens. I never run dry, but tonight. Uh, maybe I'm getting ready to let go. I'm the Lord just getting ready to hold me down here tonight. I, I don't know. Uh, this divine responsibility. Have you ever thought of God's responsibility to us as uh, his people tonight in, in uh, holding us accountable? Thank you, brother. Appreciate that so much. Chuck, thank you, buddy. It's, I, 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 I'll probably pour it all on me before I get done. Mm. Thank you. I need to go to class 101 on drinking water. <laughs> Divine responsibility. God's perfect law and order. He has a perfect law and order. You can't look at the universe and not know he's, a, right. he's one of perfect order. He, he orders everything. Uh, all of it works uh, in perfect order. Uh, all the animal kingdom, uh, everything works in perfect The only thing that don't work in perfect order is man. Everything else is obedient, uh, uh, following uh, what God has laid out and set out. Uh, but us, as human beings, uh, one of the biggest questions in contemporary America tonight is the question of divine, or uh, not divine justice, but justice, period. Uh, Everybody wants judgment. Everybody says, well, life's not fair. I, I, I just, I've got a bad break or this is not working right. And uh, uh, where's God's judgment? Where's God's judgment when, when children are being gunned down in the schools, uh, in the streets where they live, uh, uh, drive-by shootings where babies are killed in the crib uh, by a stray bullet. They go, where's God? That's what man wants to know. Where's God doing all these things that are happening? Where's God uh, in the Afghan uh, mess? 20 years of pouring in America's, America's treasure of its money, of its men, of its women. Uh, and now things are in a worse shape uh, than before anybody ever went in there. It's in worse shape. The people that are in worse shape, they're going through uh, situations where thousands have lost their home, getting ready to lose their lives, uh, lose their businesses, jobs, uh, uh, families. Where is God in all of that? This is what mankind wants to know. Uh, all of mankind tonight is really uh, the heart uh, is looking for uh, towards where's the lack of justice in our land. Uh, why is there such a lack of judgments uh, about health issues uh, that seem like it is not fair in how things are dealt with and, and carried out or financial issues or even security issues tonight? Uh, mankind wants to know uh, down deep also where and how can I be safe? How can I have a fair life and a good life? Uh, 
Shouldn't every politician be about law and order? Shouldn't every one that we elect, shouldn't they be about our interest? Uh, there's their job to deal with the bad guys. And how come all the bad guys seemingly are being let go and, and there's no justice? You know, people might not think about God too much, but they're thinking about this thing called justice. And the sad part of it is, this question about judge, justice is one of the reasons it's important to study the book of Ezekiel. Now listen. It shows God divine judgment against sin, against rebellion, and disobedience. If mankind thinks for a moment that he can just do anything he wants to, live how he wants to, and there's not day of reckoning coming, uh, then he's missing understood what God has said in his word. Uh, he hasn't seemed to got a grasp uh, of what heaven's about or what hell is about. It doesn't seem to understand what uh, the cross has stood for uh, in God's provision. Uh, the book of Ezekiel is often neglected. Uh, its message missed. Uh, yet it's very pertinent for the days in which we live today. It's a book as relevant as it gets for this day in which we live. Uh, as we've been looking at it now for uh, over this past year, uh, as we have been looking at it on every Wednesday night, uh, some say the book of Ezekiel, it's like, it's like the book of Revelation. It's just, you, you can't understand it. It's not really uh, uh, important for the day in which we live. You can't understand the message is not, really not for us. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm going to tell you the book of Ezekiel is not hard to understand. It requires some study. It requires matching scripture against scripture. It's a ma it, it requires us praying and getting the mind and the heart of God. What he, what's being said here. And uh, it's very practical for us today. Now Ezekiel has a message from God. He's, he's given this message. And it's as relevant for us today as it was to those elders in that day. Uh, because it's a deal detailed account uh, of what God is doing uh, and what God is doing in that day with Ezekiel and that crowd that is now sitting in Babylon uh, and they've been there about seven years now and they've got uh, 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 some more years to go. They'd be there for 70 years uh, and uh, so God is still uh, working with this crowd. He hadn't forgotten who's exactly where he was and so he gives a message to Ezekiel the year is, 19, the year is 591 B uh, uh, and so in five years from this time that he started this message, uh, the city of Jerusalem and its temple is going to be leveled to the ground. It's going to be burned. Nobody even in that day would have ever thought that would ever happen. They couldn't fathom the temple being destroyed, much less Jerusalem. They couldn't imagine God giving up on the city where he put his name. They couldn't imagine or fathom the temple where they would meet with him would now be destroyed. The word <laughs> uh, the Babylonians had set fire to the city of Jerusalem in the temple. The word sword is used 19 times in this chapter 21. It's an image of God's judgment. God uses the image of fire and of a sword for uh, a judgment. It represents the invasion attack of the Babylonian army on, on Jerusalem. God even declared that it was my sword. He's not putting it on by, he said, I'm dealing with this. This is my issue. He called it his sword because he's the one who ordered the Babylonian army to invade Jerusalem. Nobody could imagine or thought God does something like that. That's right. They were his people. They were his chosen people. He'd, he'd walk with them out of, of, of Egypt. He walked with them for 40 years across that desert. Uh, he had taken care of, brought them into the promised land. Who would ever thought that God would turn around and unleash the Babylonian army on his people? Well, may I say this? You see, I, you have asked the average person tonight in America, would God ever allow America to come under judgment 
Oh, no, Pastor, we, we sent out more missionaries than anybody else. Uh, we're the place where uh, we have all the churches on every corner. We're the one that's got TV programming that goes all over the world. No, 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 Pastor, no. You, you can't, you can't, I can't imagine that. If his own people won't obey him, that was the problem. His own people, rebellious, disobedient, wouldn't obey God. So God took it to the heathens and the pagans that would obey him. Isn't it strange that sometimes the people you work with that have no faith in God sometimes are morally and better and nicer than sometimes church folks? Something's wrong with that picture. The world sees it, and they, they wonder, how, in that, how can that be? You would have thought all the details. The people had surely would have had paid attention to what Ezekiel had said. Uh, he had it in perfect detail of the predictions uh, that were coming by Ezekiel, and especially when you consider the magnitude of the destruction that was about to take place. You would have thought somebody would have had a wake-up call to look. Uh, I, you know, we, we, we better get serious about this thing. This, this is too much detail here. Uh, this is going to be a, such a big deal. I, I think somebody better wake up. Have you ever thought about us? We've had fires out all over the west. We've had floods uh, all over the east. Uh, everywhere in between, we've had one wake-up call and, a, and another. And it seems like we care little uh, today about what God's Word said or what He stands for. And we are allowing everything to happen uh, uh, that can happen that would transgress God's Word. It seems like it makes no difference. Who's responsible for it? Not God. It's for us. Uh, we're the people. We're the ones tonight that have been taught and brought to a place of understanding. God is God. And God is holy. God is righteous. Uh, God loves uh, those tonight that obey and serve and walk in his word. Uh, I, it's, it's amazing to me. But here's the problem. Let me get down to where the problem is tonight. The human heart is so incurably evil. And coupled with unbelief when it comes to the things of God. Desperately wicked, Jeremiah said. Desperately wicked. Who can know it save God? You know, sometimes we think that most people, they live kind of in a spiritual stupor. And it's true. We, we, we just kind of on autopilot sometimes. Yeah. Just on all of that. Now, it's one thing to be in an airline and be uh, uh, flying, uh, you know, 20 years in the Air Force. I know that you, you can set that plane on autopilot and it, it, it program it, it, it gets the Dutch thing. But I'm going to tell you, when it comes to the spiritual things, you can't get on autopilot. The devil's not going to let you live on autopilot. He's not going to you, let you live comfortably uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and rebellion and sin against God. He, he, he's just not going to do that. God's not going to do that. Most people live in a spiritual stupor. I, I kind of look at it this way. I'm, I'm kind of a simple person. Anyway, look at it. It's kind of numb and dumb. <laughs> when it comes to the thing of, things of God, just kind of numb and dumb. As God's, to God's justice system called judgment, his justice system called judgment. Our text, chapter 21 here, is a heavy, heavy chapter about God's judgment coming on Judah and Jerusalem. Even the elders uh, who should have known better, even the elders that should have had an understanding uh, of what Ezekiel was saying, uh, uh, reasoned among themselves and, and began to kind of think among themselves that the prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple had to be wrong. And they, they, they were stinging them out, you know, Let's, let's talk this thing out. Uh, you know, it, it can't be that God's going to destroy the temple because if they destroyed the temple, we would have nowhere to worship. We'd have nowhere to meet with him. It was a temple where we meet with God. It was in a place of the Holy of Holies where God resides. If, if, if then God destroyed the temple, destroyed all of that, then all of that that the prophets, the patriarchs had said about the promises and the laws of God, that would be null and void. 
Can you, can you see their reasoning uh, uh, as they begin to talk uh, uh, in their minds? Uh, they begin to reason this thing out uh, that God, oh, this is not going to happen. It, it's not going to happen. We, we're not going to go through anything like that because it would take God out of the picture and God would never uh, go back on his word uh, in uh, giving us his laws and his promises and all that. They will not be null and void. So to their understanding, it was just not possible that God should ever do that or destroy the temple. Now, understand the reason why they thought that way. Very simple. They didn't know the Word of God. Oh, Pastor, no, no, no. Uh, they lived in the five books of Moses. They, uh, they, 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 they memorized. They had all the, you, you can memorize the Bible all you want to and yet not know it. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to live it. You can read it, you can memorize it, but you better liberalize it. <laughs> yeah. Moses had said in Deuteronomy 28, chapter verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, the, all, to observe all, to do all that his commandments and his statutes is commanded thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Yes. In other words, you can't outrun. You cannot That's outrun right. the hand of judgment. Yeah. Just can't do it. Huh? From verses 16 to verse 68 of that chapter in the book of, Mo, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy uh, deals with what happens to those who walk away from God and forsake his laws and forsake God. Forty-five verses that deal with what happens when God sees that a person is absolutely off track, not willing to come in under obedience and discipline. God has a plan for that. And so 45 verses covered. There's many other places that God foretells, foretold the same thing, exactly what would happen if they forsook him and his laws. They didn't read. They didn't know. They didn't uh, have his word because they weren't really interested in it. Those elders didn't realize as they sat before Ezekiel. Now listen. They didn't realize that as they sat before Ezekiel that what Ezekiel was predicting and saying to them would one day become as much a part of the Bible right. as the five books of the Pentateuch which they ordinarily profess to believe in. You'd ask any one of them about the book. Oh, yeah, yeah man, I did. it's absolutely right on top. While they might have known it, they didn't live it. They didn't believe it. They didn't trust it. You know, it's really sad when you realize that we're speaking of, that, of the church of that day. That was the church. That was his people. Sad to say the same thing is happening today in our world tonight. Uh, the phrase uh, in verse 2, uh, and prophesy against the land is especially onimous, but onimous because what follows is enough to bring anyone to repentance uh, except those that are living in total disbelief. Uh, yeah. Now understand these words are given by the Holy Spirit declaring doom and judgment. It's not, it's not some man uh, just uh, putting this in order. This is God giving this word by the Holy Spirit that this, this is what's going to happen. Uh, declaring that. Uh, and they'd been hearing this message now from Jeremiah uh, and Ezekiel for over 35 years. Jeremiah being older than Ezekiel they had heard this thing for over 35 years. In fact, Jeremiah preached for 42 years, never won a convert. I don't know too many preachers could handle that. Uh, uh, very much day in and day out, trying to stand up and talk and give a message from the Lord and nobody wanting to hear it. All the mockery and all the uh, uh, scorn, all that taking place. Uh, not too many can handle that kind of uh, rejection. But Jeremiah did. Oh, he, he, oh yeah, he, there was a time where he, he thought, well, I'm, man, I'm, I'm sick of this, Lord. I'm, 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 I'm not going to do it no more. Nobody's listening. I'm sick of it. I'm so he, he sat back out of it. But all of a sudden, he said this word. 
There's a fire shut up in my bones that I can't stay. I had to go back to preaching. I had to go back to talking about the message of God. For 42 years he would do that. It's really sad when we understand here what's taking place. Listen, as the word of God is delivered and has and is heard with such a negative response, that individual is in big trouble. Think about this. You can't afford to ignore the Holy Spirit. Every time we come in the house of God, the Spirit of God is moving, or the Word of God goes forth, and that Word begins to penetrate your heart. And you know, and, it's, and it witnesses in your spirit, this is the Word of God. And he's talking to me. Every single time we respond negatively or don't listen to it, or not willing to do something about it, and we just kind of brush it off, ignore it. Every single time that happens, our heart gets a little bit harder. Hardens. And this is what had been happening with Israel over the years. So this saves the hearts of those religious leaders. And the people had become so increasingly negative and skeptical towards God's word. Regrettably, the same thing is happening to us today. There's a type of unbelief that is very chilling. Listen, there's very little reverence and respect for the name of the Lord, the things of God today. You look at the blasphemy over TV, radio, the internet, the social media, as well as all the other walks of life, the things that are planted on T-shirts and, yeah. and, and caps and all kinds of things that you see in our society today, that just is, it's, we've got to that time where the Bible says they will not blush, right. neither will they be ashamed. And we're in that moment now. Yeah. It has been increasingly immoral, vicious, abusive, noxious, maliciously, spiteful, depraved, degenerate, and demonic. And if I wasn't so bashful, I'd say it a little bit stronger. <laughs> Verse 3, thus saith the Lord... I am against you. There is nothing in heaven or earth worse than that. Yeah, amen. God had promised you that no weapon formed against you will prosper. But when you get to the place and we get to the place that we're no longer walking with God and, and, and he is uh, now against us. That's a place you never want to be, my friend. You don't want to be in that place. Last thing you'd ever want to have is God against you. Uh, down through all the centuries, uh, uh, God's strength had been exclusively uh, uh, upon Israel. They had had all the blessings that anybody could have. Israel had been uh, gained their status and all of their acquired success and riches and prosperity, all because of God's blessing. God had poured out his blessing. Now, that is, God is against him. There's no more protection, no more provision. Uh, there's no more support, no more strength, no more prosperity, uh, no more source of help. The surrounding nations which they had wanted to emulate and be like and worship like, act like, uh, uh, certainly did not love them or care about them. And actually would gloat over their uh, uh, demise. Because of the rebellion against God, they were now absolutely defenseless for the first time in their history. Has it ever bothered you that since World War II, we have not won a battle, a war? Think about that. Something is wrong. Could it be that we as a nation needs to search our heart? We say many times we need a revival. Revival starts with individual searching of a heart. Come on. Come on. The phrase in verse 3, And will draw forth my sword out of his sheath. Hundreds of thousands would be killed. Mm -hmm. And it could have been stopped by a simple Repentance before God. Did you know things could be turned around? Your family, your life, 
our nation, our city, our community with a simple repentance before God. God, I'm sorry. I need to clean up some things. I need to get some things right. I need to turn around. I need to go another direction. I need your help. I need to honor your word. Simple repentance and say, God, I, I, I've been wrong. I want to do it right. That's all it would take would be to turn, turn things around. The phrase, and will cut off from them you the righteous and the wicked. It has two meanings here. The righteous would be cut off in the sense that God would no longer hear their cries concerning Jerusalem. He had told Jeremiah, don't you pray for them. Don't pray for them. Judgment's coming. It's a done deal. Don't pray for them. They're past now the ability to help them. They don't want it. Judgment's coming. Don't pray for them. You know, this has a, no reverence now to the righteous going and being spiritual lost. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't talk about it. It's talking about the cry on the behalf of Jerusalem to be spared when already God has proclaimed judgment upon it. The second thing here, the wicked word we cut off in death, destruction, and judgment. Their mocking God would stop. They would experience the fulfillment of his word uh, of prophecy with their own eyes. They would see with their own eyes what God had been trying to say to them. Have you ever thought one day America could face the same reality? Let's too careful now. Uh, Revelation 18, 17, for in one hour so great a riches is come to naught. Verse 18, and cried when they saw the smoke of this burning uh, uh, saying, what city is like unto this great city? I know I was talking about Babylon. But God has no problem taking any city or great nation down. That's right. um, nobody could ever imagine American Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Pastor, that's that's foreign. That would never happen there. We've got so many Hannah missiles. We've got this. We've got that. Let me tell you something. When a place that comes under judgment right. of God, you can have everything in the world. And it, it, it will not mean nothing during that time of judgment. Amen. Even now, Islamic terrorist organizations are trying to get their hands on nuclear weapons. Uh, what if the atomic suitcases uh, went into the major cities of the United States and all at one time were detonated. Oh, Pastor, uh, uh, you, 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 that, that cannot happen. How do you know that? I'll tell you, I'll tell you ones that do know, I'll tell you what they have said. Eugene Hubbringer, former executive chief of strategic weapons at the Pentagon, said this, an event of nuclear Megaterrorism on U.S. soil is not a matter of if, but when. Warren Buffett, who establishes odds against cosmetic events for major insurance companies, concluded that a nuclear nightmare within the United States is virtually a certainty. These people, these people they, 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 they've got some insight that you and I don't have to think that it could not happen. Our problem is that sometimes we're living in a, a spiritual fog. We're living in a spiritual fog, a religious deception, worse than even these elders who sat in front of Ezekiel. One of the most important chapters in all the book of Ezekiel is this chapter 21 because it reveals the king of Babylon removes the last king of the Davidic dynasty until the Messiah comes. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it happened. We've got the history. Yeah, amen. Verse 6, God said, I'm cutting it off now. I'm moving with a sword and I will destroy the city all the way from the south to the north. Uh, none will be spared. Verse 5, uh, says that all flesh may know that I won't stop until judgment has been fulfilled. This judgment... It's a fair judgment. It was deserved. Sometimes we don't like to think we deserve 
negative things or problems. We, we think we can live any kind of way we want to. We can treat our bodies the way we want to. And, and, and it, nothing deserves to happen to bring us to an understanding that God has some moral laws. The phrase in verse 6, sigh, means groan. It refers to Ezekiel's heartbreaking reality of this coming judge. He is seeing this. He knows this is going to happen. It's tearing him up on the inside. The phrase with bitterness, sigh, before their eyes uh, refers to, uh, to Ezekiel greatly being moved uh, as he's weeping before the elders, seeing this picture that God is bringing to him. It wasn't an act. It was an admonition from the Lord that he was not to hold back his emotions. Sometimes we preachers are more apt at humor than we are tears. But what he was to do was to let his emotions go. Even though the elders heard what they he had said, even though they saw him moved in compassion and brokenness and bitterness over what he was experiencing, what was about to happen, they didn't appear to be moved at all. It was a picture of a hard heart. I've seen that many, many times over the years, the last 40 some years. People under conviction, uh, people where the Spirit of God was moving in the service, uh, 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 times when People just would absolutely shake on the power of the Holy Spirit dealing with them, and yet get up out of the seat, walk out the door. Missing an opportunity to let God do really what He wants to do is a makeover in their lives to change them. It's a picture of a hard heart, uh, because, and it's sad to see because once that takes place, there's no remedy. Without God, there's no other remedy. There's no other way to be saved without him. Verse 7, the phrase, Behold, it comes and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord. It presents the proclamation, but it wasn't believed by the listeners. The word came. The message came, but it wasn't received. We can have stacks of Bibles in our homes but unless they're read and unless the word is received, the proclamation can be there, but unless it's received, it's another story. That which Ezekiel had been going through, the Bible says exactly what will happen. And then he says, when that happens, here's what's going to happen. He said, first of all, every heart's going to melt. The hands are going to become feeble in other words the hands will work uh, the very life of people will faint there's a, a faint to them uh, uh, the strong knees shall be made weak as water I th often have thought about Belshazzar when that hand came out of the sleeve of the night began to write on that palace wall a message of judgment upon Babylon and upon Belshazzar. The Bible says his, his knees smoked one against another. You, you know, you can, you can sit in the house of God. You go through the service. You go through an order of service. But I'll tell you, when you come face to face with the holy God, it's a different story. It's easy to go through a service when you're, just, you're looking to watch and waiting for the time to be up, ready to get out, go to lunch. It's another thing when the presence of God is, is dealing with you. And you've got a sense that something needs to change here. You say the phrase here, the tidings, meant this bad news. This is not going to be good news. This news that is coming not going to be good news. And, and he's laying it out. The elders had lived and preached a lifestyle of trivialty, lifestyle of levity, frivolity, flippancy. It just, it seemed like it meant nothing. But now they're face to face with the Word of God. Life of being righteous. It's when we got to live. It's not an option for us. He's a holy God. He calls us to righteousness. He calls us to be holy. He said, 
be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, that's not a happy message. Uh, when you begin to talk about judgment and the possibility of it hitting uh, our country, there's not a military man who would ever want to see that, much less anybody else. But I'm going to tell you, our nation tonight needs its people to pray. Amen. We need revival. And, and you can say that over and over, but how many are willing to take time to pray? How many times a day do we are willing to take a little time with God and get along with Him and say, God, I can't, I can't, I can't speak for nobody else, but deal with me. Get me to the place I need to be. Turn, turn me in the direction I need to go. Help me to understand that. The harvest is out there, and the Bible says it's white, it's ready to be brought in. And I'm going through church, just going through service after service with no thought that my neighbor, the one down the street, or the one I work with, is on his way to judgment. And I'm not said a thing to him. You see, that's what this Sunday morning thing is about. We've got two more weeks of it. I want you to stay with me on it. Because this outreach ministry that we're, we're talking about is, a, is an opportunity for us to get in our community and begin to change the dynamics of some of the people's lives and where they're living. Are you going to be able to reach everybody? Absolutely not. There's going to be some, no matter what you do, just don't, don't want don't want to change. But there's some out there tonight, I can tell you, that are waiting for somebody to talk to them. God's already prepared the heart. The Holy Spirit's already dealt with them. Just one word to them, and the Lord can do a mighty word. Well, I've done run over again. I know, uh, let me t stop tonight. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to go to prayer this evening, and, and I want to certainly remember. Uh, Stoney and Terry on their vacation. We'll just give them a great time. Want to remember Terry Hardish tonight still. This evening, uh, I am and Harriet, thank the Lord they got back today from the trip, and uh, thank you so much for praying for them. Uh, they're 87 years old, both of them 87 years old, and I, I told him before he left Sunday, I said, now look, you get up.